I am happy to be here at this venerable old institution, the oldest in the country for te technology education, I guess. <coughs> I am happy to be here. Well, my subject of my talk, as you see, is mathematics, art that would rather be science. This is a somewhat old subject, it is not new. People have always asked whether ma mathematics is an art or science. It displays aspects of both art and science in many ways. But maybe in some ways it is more art than science and that is what I want to talk about today. <coughs> mathematics is probably the, uh, as had acquired independent identity as an intellectual discipline. Uh, early on in history, more than 5000 years ago already there was pursuit of mathematics as an intellectual activity. There are uh, clay tablets dating more than 5000 years ago uh, discovered in Mesopotamia in modern Iraq which has for instance a list of Pythagorean triples, triples of whole numbers x, y, z such that x square plus y square equal to z square. That kind of list is found in a, that is of about 50, 50 or 60 of them in a clay tablet which is found in, uh, in Iraq and that is dated more than 5000 years ago. So, that is the kind of uh, age that mathematics has had as an independent intellectual activity and more in fact it was even greatly respected as a wonderful intellectual activity as is evident at least in this country, we have uh, as evidence the shloka which tells us that it is a Sanskrit shloka dating back to 7th century uh, before the common era and you can read that yatha shikha mayuranam naganam maneo yatha tatha vedanga shastranam ganitam buddha nishtitam. It says like the crest of the peacock and the jewel on the head of the serpent, mathematics stands at the head of all sciences. This is the translation of the shloka. So, it was greatly respected. Vedanga Shastranam Ganitam Muddha it says, stands on the head. And uh, Plato in 5th century before Christ uh, wrote in his uh, book called The Republic, wrote that every person who aspires to lead must have training in mathematics. That that is a necessary step for any person who wants to be a leader is what he says in, the, in, the, in his book Republic. So, it, in, in Greece too it is greatly respected mathematics and the sentiment expressed here was later expressed 2500 years later expressed by Carl Friedrich Gauss the greatest mathematician one of the greatest mathematicians of all times. He said mathematics is the queen of all sciences. And there is also a rider and he said number theory is the queen of mathematics. I will come to that, but the point here is that he called it the queen of sciences. And in fact, mathematics does display many qualities of this royal personage, the queen. There are many qualities of the queen which you can see in mathematics too. Firstly, even as a royal person, it stands apart from the common people. Mathematics stands a little apart from other sciences. Look at the title of Newton's great book, Philosophy Naturalis Principia Principia Mathematica. That means natural uh, mathematical principles of natural philosophy. So, natural philosophy is science. It says mathematical principles. So, you apply mathematical principles to natural philosophy. So, it stands a little apart. And in fact, in many ways, a, a discipline becomes it is to be called science only after some mathematical intervention physics or chemistry all these subjects there is always some mathematical intervention which is what has given them the uh, label science. So, in that sense mathematics stands a little apart from the sciences the queen of course stands a little apart from the common people. So, that is a quality which it shares with the queen. Again you know in mathematics uh, it is called the queen of sciences and very rightly so it goes did not call it the king of sciences cause it queen, queen of sciences which is probably why nobody bothers to dispute it. You see the king has always been a very powerful person in the political world. The queen was often more not, not more than decoration historically because there are some exceptions like the queen Elizabeth the second 
uh, sorry, Elizabeth I of England or the Catherine the Great of Russia. There are a handful of exceptions like that in history, but by and large, the Queen has largely been considered a decoration and nothing more. The King was, of course, all important. The, king, the followers of the Queen, the courtiers, they are what you would call the people who occupied page three in the newspapers. Whereas King's courtiers were important people, they made news all the time. So that was the kind of distinction. So, which is probably why for, for the physicists or scientists uh, or chemists are willing to grant that mathematics is the queen of sciences. Maybe they would have uh, disputed it if it called it the king of sciences. So in that sense too. And look at this, this, uh, this picture uh, portrays the queen in a nursery rhyme, which says the king was in the counting house counting out, out his money. The queen was in the parlor eating bread and honey. King attends a serious business. Whereas the queen is doing a flippant thing, eating bread and honey. That's, that, that's what she's doing. Unlike the king, who is too serious counting his money. So in some sense, the queen is portrayed as someone who is somewhat self-indulgent, pursuing her pleasure and not the public interest, so to speak. <coughs> well, that is true of mathematics. In some sense, mathematics, mathematicians pursue what they think is interesting. If they are not bothered about whether it has applications, whether it is really relevant to the external world or not. Sometimes they do, but not always. Most of the time, in fact, they don't. Sometimes the problems do come from the external world, but the way they look at it and the way they go about building on it is to look at the internal structure of the problem, of the mathematical problem they've come to. They, they're not all that any longer, I mean, once the problem has come to them, they're not all that much interested in where it came from or why it came from. Why, why it came along, but they become interested in the actual structure of this. <coughs> I will illustrate that but by many examples. So there is a, an element of self-intelligence if you like and the queen is of course, you know, historically it's always been a self-intelligent person if you like and that is portrayed in the nursery rhyme as well. Well, next, the queen is supposed to be whimsical. She takes decisions which are uh, purely spontaneous and on the spot something she thinks of and she takes. The queen there is the queen in Alice in it's an illustration of the Alice in Wonderland by Louis Carroll, a famous book. Incidentally, Louis Carroll was a mathematician and much of his humor is drawn from mathematical logic. Well, so she says in one place the queen says, I shall ask Alice, do, can, can, can you believe impossible things before breakfast? And I myself believe 20 impossible things before breakfast. That kind of statements are made in that book. This is the, anyway, she is whimsical and at the drop of hat you will have people's heads cut off. Well, mathematics is also whimsical. The sense that the decision on what problems are interesting, what, what we will work on, made by mathematicians are simply what they decided on the basis of what they fancy very often. You will see many examples of that as we go along. I will illustrate the examples. But the most, yeah, but the most uh, important, if you like, uh, the, in the public imagination, the most important quality a queen has is she is beautiful. The queen is supposed to be beautiful in the popular imagination. And this queen, of course, I showed you, was, was not beautiful by no means, the uh, queen in Alice in Wonderland. But in general, the, in popular perception, the queen is supposed to be beautiful. And in fact, if you look at mythological stories, all queens are beautiful. Sita was known for her beauty and uh, so was uh, Draupadi. Uh, Madri, who was the Pandu's queen, was also a renowned beauty and so on. And <coughs> we know also that uh, what kind of trouble the beauty of a semi-historical queen cost recently for a filmmaker when he made this movie Padmavat. <coughs> and well, closer to our times and closer to reality, there was a queen who was considered one of the most beautiful women in the world. This was the Maharani Gayatri Devi of Jaipur. And you can see her picture there. This was she was considered one of the most beautiful women in the world. She was the Queen Maharani of Jaipur. 
Well, so beauty is an important aspect. I mean, quality the queen is supposed to possess. And mathematics has that. Mathematics is beautiful. Well, I probably don't have to convince my mathematics friends here, but I don't know if there are non-mathematical people here. I will try to, during this lecture, I will try to convince them that there is beauty in mathematics. <coughs> well, what is beauty? It's difficult to define beauty. I don't think you can make a definition. But perhaps the best definition you can make is this. It's, it, this is uh, from a long poem, Endymion, by John Keats, one of the famous uh, English poets. And that line there, I think of beauty is a joy forever. That can be taken as the definition of beauty. Something which produces joy forever is what is beautiful. Beautiful is something which produces joy forever. I don't think you can find any better definition. It's impossible to define. And uh, in fact, most people don't ask for a definition. They intuitively know what beauty is. It's the mathematician who usually fusses about definitions. He wants definition for everything. But well, even the mathematician doesn't insist on a definition of beauty. But this can very well be taken as a definition of beauty. And if this is the definition of beauty, I can immediately produce something which produced joy forever for over 2,500 years. What was that? That is the book, book Euclid's Elements. Euclid's Elements has been a favorite with uh, people with a mathematical or even a scientific mind, has been a favorite, has produced great uh, pleasure and joy to people over more than 2,500 years. The book was written in the third century before Christ and it has right down to modern times. It is one of the great books which is studied by many people with great pleasure. And if that is not joy forever, I don't know what joy forever is. And if beauty is joy forever, certainly that book, the mathematics of the book possesses that joy forever. <coughs> so that's the first case I'm making for mathematics being beautiful. And here is a comment by a public intellectual a name which many of you li are likely to know, Burton Russell. Mathematics rightly viewed possesses not only truth, but supreme beauty. Beauty, cold and austere, like that of, that of sculpture, without appeal to our weaker nature, without the gorgeous trappings of painting or music, and capable of stern perfection, such as only the greatest art can show. This is what Burton Russell says. Of course, Russell was a mathematician, and so he has his biases, but he is not, not so, known so much for his mathematics, and for his other writings, philosophy, and he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in, I don't know which year, some, some point he won the Nobel Prize for Literature, and he was well-known public intellectual, wrote extensively on issues of peace and things of that kind, and nuclear uh, warfare and things of that kind. <coughs> well, so he says that it is, it's mathematics rightly viewed possesses not only truth, but supreme beauty. But let me move on to a non-mathematician, a biologist. Usually people think, tend to think that biologists don't like mathematics. They are far away from mathematics, they don't like it. But look at what this biologist is say. For the harmony of the world is made manifest in form and number, and the heart and soul of all poetry of natural philosophy, as of philosophy is science as we understand it. All, the heart and soul of all poetry of natural philosophy are embodied in the concept of mathematical beauty. This is a famous uh, biologist, Darcy Wentworth Thompson, who, that is his statement. <coughs> well, and it's not only mathematics. All science is in many ways beautiful and you can see what Newton has to say. This is a famous quote from Newton. I do not know what I may appear to the world, but to myself I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself in now and then, finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary while the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Note the words, the smoother pebble and prettier shell is looking for beautiful things. That is, the search, what was he finding? He was finding great truths in science and mathematics. Newton is also one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. And his calculus is a discovery of great beauty, with, among other things. And he said that. Uh, of course, uh, I think you should ignore the first line. I think. That was, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> what's the word I want? Hmm. Anyway, that's, that kind of modesty was not Newton's strength. He wasn't, I mean, that's a, that's a sham. I do not know what I may appear to the world, he says. No, he jolly well knew he was considered the greatest intellectual in Europe. There's no doubt about it. He jolly well knew that, but it's a statement 
you have to make you know this. So, so but the rest of this statement displays a certain humility a modesty which is modesty when you face science when you face the uni the great ocean of truth that is genuine modesty there's no question about that then you feel small yes he certainly did that was genuine but the first sentence is not genuine <coughs> anyway but you know that kind of modesty he doesn't uh, i mean why why should newton be modest that way because kind of looking at his achievements there's no reason to be for his modest for him to be modest in that way anyway and yeah also note that it's uh, to appreciate the beauty of newton's work the language is mathematics it is the calculus that makes his work really beautiful make it understandable beautiful and that is not surprising again philosophy nature is written in that great book which ever is before us before our eyes i mean the universe but we cannot understand it if we do not first learn the language and grasp the symbols in which it is written the book is written in mathematical language this is what the great galileo has to say so the role of mathematics is important in understanding nature that's what he says and you know to understand nature when you the kind of feeling you get when you understand something suddenly after a long struggle is not dissimilar to what you feel when you see something beautiful the be- the beautiful and the uh, intelligible are i think closely related i won't be surprised if some some day somebody discovers that the seat in the brain which identifies beauty and identifies understanding is pro- probably the same place or is nearby near each other it could be it could well be possible so very often you know the effect on a person who understands something suddenly is the same as the effect somebody from gets when say he climbs up a mountain and uh, suddenly sees a beautiful panorama before him a great scenery before him and the kind of excitement feel excited feeling you get is similar to what you get when you start understanding so to be <coughs> the intelligible and the beautiful uh, i think have a close relation but not everybody thinks science is beautiful leave alone mathematics because even people who think science is beautiful may not think mathematics is beautiful here is what the poet whom i quoted earlier had to say about newton do not all charms fly at the mere touch of cold philosophy philosophy here means science natural science there was an awful rainbow we don't use the word awful these days in this meaning what he means is awesome the youngsters they say they use awesome they meant what the same thing as what keats meant when he said awful there was an awful rainbow once in heaven we know her woof for texture she is given the dull catalog of common things philosophy will clip an angel's wings conquer all mysteries by rule and line empty the haunted air and no mind unweave a rainbow so for him newton was a, essentially a vandal tearing apart the rainbow that is his point of view but there is another poet who was a great admirer of newton and his work and here is what he has said god said let newton be and all was light that's a take off from bible which has a line says god said let there be light and there was light so he said let newton be and all was light that is alexander pope <coughs> not uh, as famous a poet as keats but a very significant english poet <coughs> okay now mathematics begins with counting and there is a famous uh, saying of descartes which many of you will be familiar with cogito ergo sum which says i think therefore i am i have a take off on that so i count therefore i count the second count means i matter i count therefore i matter so that is the take off i have and i think it's it's a truthful statement because life is quite will be quite impossible if you were not able to count every one of us in the modern world has to be able to count otherwise you cannot survive for less so you matter only if you can count so that tells you that if just thinking is not enough you have to think mathematics that's what i'm trying to say okay now you know abstraction is one quality which permeates all of mathematics it consists on the one hand of locating common threads among diverse phenomena and on the other hand in identifying and rejecting the irrelevant in any particular study both are important as i will illustrate now the first intimations of mathematical activity are no doubt 
to be found in counting. But this almost involuntary act involves profound abstraction and serves to illustrate strikingly both the complementary aspects of abstraction described above. You have to be able to recognize something common among very different, apparently different uh, phenomena or things. That is the first thing requirement and second requirement is that you should ignore things which are not relevant in a particular investigation. Both things happen because oh no I am not uh, yeah both things happen. Yes. Oh no. Yeah, both things happen with counting. When you count, you see you're, you, you may be counting a number of apples in a box. Say there are five apples in a box, maybe you are counting that. Maybe you are counting the number of uh, Pandu's children, the Pandavas, they are number five. Not, nothing in common between a, an apple and a Pandava. But nevertheless, in the basket of apples and the set of Pandavas, you have found something common. Very disparate connections. You, or you may have a bunch of uh, birthday gifts, five gifts. One would be say a tie, another will be a kerchief and things are kind. But very different things, it's not the same. So, the way you are all the time ignoring the individual qualities of the various things in the collection. But you are still able to find something common between one collection and another collection. That common thing is the number of elements in that collection. And that is what enables you to count. So, counting certainly has this aspect of being able to ignore things which are not relevant for your purpose. So, something common very disparate collections. On the other hand, you are also ignoring the individual qualities. You, you, you do not care that the apple is something which you can bite into and taste and so on and you can eat and the Pandavas well, they may be able to eat you, but no, you, you may not be. Bhima may be able to eat you, but you won't be able to eat them. So, it, they are very different things. Nevertheless, you have something, <coughs> you have to ignore the individual qualities when you want to see what is common among them. So, both qualities of the abstraction are present here. Now, <coughs> of course, abstractions are often present in science, other sciences also. In physics, you say temperature, what is temperature? It is very difficult to define. All that you can say is whether two things have the same temperature and or not. And then when you want to compare, you have to artificially introduce some way of measuring temperature. You, you have discovered the thermometer to measure it. But the basic fact is what you can first do is only to say whether two objects are at the same temperature or not. And how do you do that? Well, the, the, uh, the first instance by touch you find one is hotter than the other. If they are the same temperature, you recognize it. So, the first thing you do is to see whether they are the same temperature. So, temperature is a very, temperature of an object is a very abstract concept. So, abstraction is involved in many, many different uh, uh, aspects of science. In mathematics, of course, it is the ruling, uh, sorry, yeah, it is the most important uh, thing for mathematics, whereas it is also important for other sciences. Now, counting you may not find it beautiful, most of us will not find it beautiful, but if you sometimes watch young children counting they get a lot of pressure out of it. So, there must be some beauty there. We become inured to it because it is become familiar, we do it so often at some point it becomes familiar this is what uh, Richard Dawkins called uh, anesthetic of familiarity. Familiarity acts as an anesthetic and dulls, dulls your sensibilities about beauty. So, counting has beauty and as I said the Euclid's geometry has great beauty in it as has been uh, as I explained why because it is joy forever and Euclid also made other very interesting uh, theorems outside geometry he did some number theory also and I am going to tell you about one of his great theorems which is also considered a very lovely piece of mathematics by practically all mathematicians. Certainly, by a very large number, maybe all. Well, what is that uh, statement? I am going to give you that statement now. Another beautiful piece of mathematics, which again worked to the Greeks, most specifically to Euclid. First, I, I suppose most of you know these things, but in the possible case where there are some uh, non mathematicians who are not familiar with these concepts, I will just recall some things. Recall that a prime number, or simply a prime, is a whole number greater than 1 
whose only devices are itself and one. It has no other devices. The first few primes are, in fact, I've forgotten two. Two was the first prime. Then there is three, five, seven, eleven. These are all primes. They have no factors other than themselves and one. Euclid posed himself the following question. Is the collection of all primes a finite collection? Keep on listing primes. Maybe at some point it stops. You don't have any more primes. Is that true or does it go on and on and on? This is the question Euclid raised. This is a question obviously of no practical interest. It's just Euclid's fancy Euclid's whim that he posed this question. And he answered it also. And his answer was, he answered negative. He proved the following. The set of all prime numbers is an infinite set. He proved this. And the proof, as I said, is one of the things which is considered beautiful by all people. It's a short proof. And I'm going to present this. This is all the mathematics I will talk in this lecture. Suppose the collection of primes is finite. Then we can list the primes p1, p2, up to pr. Listed. Now, define the number capital N as P1 times P2 times PR plus 1. Then N is obviously greater than all the PRs and PIs are exhausted all the primes. So, N cannot be a prime. Okay. N is not a prime, <coughs> which means that N has devices different from one in itself. So, you can write N as D times something. So, let D be the smallest of these proper devices of N, a device which is different from one and N look at all of them and take the smallest one, then n is a multiple of d. That is what a divisor means. As any divisor of d divides n, suppose some number divides d, then it divides n as well. And we see that d must be a prime. If it divides n, if, if it divides d, it is smaller than d. And if it divides n, it cannot be smaller than d because d is the smallest of all the devices. So, it follows that <coughs> d must be one of the primes for some i, it will be equal to pi for some i with 1 less than to i less than to r. Now, when n is divided by any of the pi, you get a reminder 1. That is how n was constructed. So, we have arrived at a contradiction by assuming that there are only finitely many primes p1, p2, pr. If you look at the number n plus 1, if you divide it by any of the pi, the remainder is 1. Now, I said that d has to be pi, but d divides n and so cannot leave a remainder of 1. So, that is Euclid's proof. And this was proved in the third century before Christ. So, the set of primes must be infinite. This uh, is no, uh, it's not of any great interest from a practical point of view. But you see, the question was asked because Euclid found the question interesting or beautiful, if you like, and he gave the solution, which also is beautiful. It's very economical, and it all done in five lines or six lines, and so. It, it, Practically every mathematician finds this beautiful. <coughs> and if you find it beautiful, you certainly get the right resonance from the mathematical mind. <coughs> well, I, we all know that uh, the present way of writing numbers, the so called place value system, was a discovery made in India. And in fact, uh, it is already that, that the discovery is made in India, and in particular, the zero, which is necessary for writing numbers in the <coughs> place value system is to be found in an old manuscript called the Bakshali manuscript. It is the oldest extant Indian mathematical text. It was unearthed in 1881 in the village of Bakshali near Peshawar <coughs> in Pakistan, now in Pakistan. One finds it in, finds in it the zero is a big black dot that is what I was indicated there and numbers represented using the place value system. Fourth century See, Christian era is a common era is accepted by most historians as the date of the manuscript. So, at least by 4th century uh, of the Christian era, this zero had been discovered and the place value system was known for the in India. <coughs> well, it is uh, tempting to believe that the discovery of the place value system is a response to necessity. You know, they say necessity is the mother of invention. And, but my personal feeling is that no, it was uh, aesthetic drive, the search for the beautiful that led our ancestors to the place value system and the zero. Why? Why am I saying it? The point is that uh, why do you need, what is the real use of the place value system? It is only when you deal with large numbers. 
and when did humanity start needing to deal with large numbers if you go you know go 500 years before the bakshal mass cutter even uh, nearly say 600 700 years before the bakshal mass cut at that time the persians and the greeks had huge armies armies uh, has having more than 10000 even 100000 people that kind of armies was there they didn't seem to have feel, felt any need to have the place value system they managed well enough with their clumsy way of representing numbers the old roman way which was totally clumsy they were managing with that so they didn't seem to feel the need so our people on the other hand discovered it once again the, of course the mauryans did have large armies but i, I don't know if that was the motivation because on the other hand if you look at go back to the vedic period our ancestors had names for large numbers powers of 10 up to 9 to the 19th power there are names in vedic texts for numbers like that and they wrote down they didn't write down but they could they, they had given names to numbers like 5746 in that you see when you want to give the name or pronounce the name you don't need the zero when you say 5703 there is no zero involved but when you write down of course you have to put the zero but in vedic times they didn't have the zero but the names given to numbers was following the place value system so you didn't need the zero as a place value that was not necessary but they had this and this obsession in fact there is a uh, there is a story of buddha entering a competition to name the largest number which of course is rubbish uh, there is no largest number but he entered a competition and won the competition hands down nobody else could na- name a number which is as big as what buddha named is that's a story which goes around in uh, buddhist mythology <coughs> and so my own feeling is that uh, it is an urge to be able to write down any number you want it is an aesthetic urge it's you wanted a nice way of writing any number the moment you think of it and that is what made us made our ancestors discover zero and the place value system here is the numerals in the bakshali manuscript they are not like our current uh, sorry they are not like our current uh, arabic numerals nor even the devanagari numerals which is often used in this part of the country in this part of the country <coughs> okay now the motivations for these discoveries as i said is not any external agency they were contemplating numbers per se and arrived at that system or euclid when he was contemplating numbers per se he de- defined prime numbers and proved his theorem all these were internal to mathematics the, the, the inspiration did not come from outside mathematics though i must say counting itself has its inspiration from outside it is the marketplace that gave birth to counting and all the early arithmetic which we learn in school is the marketplace that is responsible for it but at a certain point when you ask when you talk about primes the marketplace has no role and primes actually primes have found some use in recent years in cryptography but in all the 2000 years before them before us before us, when people were talking about primes it had not found any applications anyway so there are so mathematics also derives some inspiration from outside it's not always that it gets only from internally but from outside newton's mathematics calculus was certainly invented because he wanted to understand motion and without that motivation he probably would not have discovered the calculus so there are some exceptions but even when it the source is external after a certain point it takes on a life of its own and mathematicians start developing more and more studying more and more the structure the mathematical structure involved and build a huge edifice on it the which the calculus which newton started was this with the specific intention of uh, motion but people didn't stop with once motion had been explained using the calculus and the differential equations of which newton uh, offered they didn't stop talking about the calculus they went on to make the calculus put the calculus on a firmer hold uh, firmer foundation and went on to discover more and more facts about differentiation and integration which are purely internal to mathematics nothing to do with the external world however at a later point people also noticed started noticing that many of these new developments of the calculus which are not motivated by any external applications found applications elsewhere now in 
physics and chemistry they found uh, these developments found new applications so it's a symbiotic relationship as i say in, when when some mathematics is born of uh, from outside inspiration it still takes on life of its own and develops along lines which are which are dictated by internal considerations but again it makes contact with the external world at some point these are two mathematicians joseph fourier and uh, karl jacobi <coughs> they were contemporaries uh, fourier was somewhat senior man so fourier was a great friend of napoleon's and uh, fourier is a well known name uh, even outside the mathematical community in fact uh, the physicists probably know more about uh, fourier's work than the mathematicians do he did some very important work on heat fourier and introduced what is called the fourier series in connection with that anyway fourier apparently once uh, admonished ja jacobi for pursuing useless mathematics and here is uh, jacobi's response a scientist of fourier's caliber should know that the true end of science is the greater glory of the human mind and under that title a question about numbers is worth as much as a question about the system of the world so euclid's obsession with number theory was as uh, legitimate as newton's obsession with motion is what jacobi would like to say and this is a point of view which is held by many many mathematicians they do not think that something which is applicable is necessarily superior to something which is in fact they tend to think that something which is not applicable not necessarily applicable if it's more beautiful in quotes in their view is the more important thing to pursue <coughs> well we I would say, I would say that these are <coughs> yeah <coughs> see the effort of the mathematician is always most of the time is to understand the mathematical structure itself even an applied mathematician he converts some engineering or physics problem into a mathematical problem and then what he is studying is to unravel the mathematical problem so it's uh, it is still mathematics and not physics or engineering what he what the applied mathematician does is mathematics and what how does the mathematician go about it see if if you look at uh, mathematical work what mathematician proves a theorem but he proves a theorem he argues logically but at every step what's happening is he is not using the full information he has he often drops most of the information and only picks up something relevant and goes on and on this is somewhat like what the sculptor does the sculptor sees a piece of stone but in his mind he can see inside it something else he was the ashoka pillar was cut the three lines is what the artist the sculptor had in mind from some amorphous piece of stone and it chips away you are you seem to be getting rid of some material all the time but in the, at the end we produce this so the this work of the mathematician is not dissimilar to the work of the sculptor like similarly that i just gave two uh, examples of sculptors a uh, sculpture one going back to the 3rd century ashoka lion capital while the nike the wind goddess of victory goes back to the 2nd century by the way the shoes nike is named after this goddess that's where the name comes from <coughs> okay now yeah again let me give another example of uh, developments in mathematics which were all dictated by aesthetics and not by any external consideration we all know how to solve the quadratic equation the quadratic equation the solutions written down there minus b plus r minus root of b square minus 4ac divided by 2a is a solution which we learn at school i don't know what the 8th standard 9th standard is the time when we learn it at school when was this first discovered first when did they start looking at quadratic equation and why linear equations came in early and that can obviously have practical applications though the practical applications of linear equations in our textbooks school textbooks are often artificial they will tell you four pencils and three pens cost so much two pencils and eight pens cost so much so find out whoever the basic data given is ne is never 
what you get normally i mean not uh, naturally it's an artificial kind of thing but anyway it, you can see that there can be practical problems for which linear equations are necessary but quadratic equation i don't know not at, an, at no elementary level is the quadratic equation ever encountered in practical matters not in your uh, <coughs> day to day market dealings no it won't come linear equations come, but not quadratic but nevertheless mathematicians wanted to solve the quadratic equation and it was solved as early as uh, certainly by brahmagupta's time which is 7th century it was solved indians knew the quadratic solutions of quadratic was also known to other people uh, the chinese as well as the greeks they knew how to solve the equation but so it's actually a merge somehow You for, they form the quadratic equation already formulated. The, 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 there are quadratic equations which are formulated in the Mesopotamian tablets, though there is no solution given there, but they are formulated. So the obsession with that dates back to 5,000 years. By this time, of, uh, of Brahma Gupta, it has been solved. But why? I don't know. It's just an urge. Somehow this, these people came across. Uh, the equation in it's a purely mathematical construct i have uh, looked at the equation and they want to solve it it's some kind of search for the beautiful if you like and they arrived at this and once they arrived at it they didn't stop there naturally the you know, mathematical equation what about the cubic equation and uh, took another 500 years 600 years before the cubic equation even more uh, bambuta lived in seven it took something like 800 years before the cubic equation was solved the cubic equation in fact there are many attempts to solve the cubic equation including by baskara acharya in the 12th century and uh, two islamic scholars uh, most people would not know that umar kayam was also a mathematician was leading mathematician of his time and he attempted to solve the cubic and there was a, another mathematician whose name just now I, arab mathematician whose name i forget who also attempted they failed all this in the 11th century in fact uh amar umar kayam of course is well known to be a poet you know baskar acharya's dilavati all the problems are posed in poems every problem is a poem the solutions are more prose there's no problem. but every problem is posed a problem and he displays great imagination in those uh, problems uh, so he has a, i mean he had certainly poetic talents in the book dilavati uh, displays that and he has also something in common with the other arab mathematician they share the same year of birth and year of death anyway that's uh, <laughs> important <coughs> so so these are the three people yeah, the other man was altusi uh, umar kayam uh, baskara at umar kayam and uh, altusi i think there are old uh, pictures uh, based on which this uh, old paintings so these are probably they are probably authentic but baskar acharya i don't think is authentic it is some artist version of baskar acharya <coughs> you know our uh, historical documents are very weak very often they don't uh, you don't have real pictures of people which you can say the man looked like this somebody picked up this uh, i i personally would have preferred some other artistic impression not this but anyway <laughs> that's one which the it one which i found on the internet so <coughs> okay so these three guys tried very hard and didn't succeed and finally it's only in the 16th century that this man nicolo tattaglia managed to solve the cubic he wrote down the solution of the cubic equation and a little later working on the base of uh, tattaglia's work ferrari solved the fourth degree equation and then of course there was uh, an attempt to attack the fifth degree equation can you get solutions and so on now came a big surprise the point was and that surprise came from the man on the left hendrik abel who as you can see died at the age of 27 <coughs> by that time he made a profound discovery he in fact showed that you cannot find a solution of the Uh, the quintic fifth degree equation along the lines of the earlier cubic or biquadratic and so on to explain exactly what this is little technical he he 
short that you they they call it solving by radicals so you using a, you want expressions made out of the coefficients of the equation and they call it solving by radicals and what abel proved it was a revolutionary discovery that for the fifth degree equation in general you cannot solve the equation like you did the quadratic or the by with the cubic or the by quadratic so and uh, the, abel's was a tragic life he did, was discovered to be a prodigy very early in life he all his uh, teachers knew him he was uh, norwegian but unfortunately in those days norway was quite poor and they didn't have uh, advanced educational institutions so they he wanted to go study elsewhere in europe where there was uh, he wanted to go to paris and getting and study there but unfortunately he didn't have the money to travel but finally eventually his friends helped and managed to find some money for him to travel in europe but unfortunately his travels in europe uh, did not have um, he did not benefit greatly by the travel he learned some mathematics in, the, in all these centers but got no recognition despite the great piece of work he had done he had done this piece of work already in norway when he was in norway in fact the great uh, mathematics of the time uh, did not pay attention to his work and he came back a somewhat embittered man to uh, <coughs> Oslo where he lived and he contracted tuberculosis and died as you can see at the age of I think he was not at 27 when he died so 1829 it's not different and as irony would have it the day after he died there was a letter or telegram from uh, Germany from Berlin offering him a professorship in Berlin well, that is the tragic story of uh, And then came along this guy Galba who died at an even younger age 21 as you can see he knew of abel's work but was not satisfied he said okay he has proved some fifth degree equations can be solved cannot be solved but given an equation can one say whether it can be solved or not this was his motivation he wanted to know he wanted to understand that whether the, given an equation whatever degree can one find out whether it can be solved by radicals or not and he formulated a profound theory to do that that's now called galva theory uh, this name is spelled g a l o i s but uh, the french have a tendency to ignore lots of consonants so it's pronounced galva which is something i when i first saw the name of course i pronounced it galois and uh, much later i learned the correct pronunciation when i knew, met people who knew how to pronounce the name anyway galva actually discovered a profound theory which is named after him galva theory now which tells you whether a given equation can be solved by radicals or not that was galva's achievement so he again died young he died in a duel he fought the duel over a woman and was killed in the duel but some papers of his survived his death It, when you die at 21 you don't write up many things but man he had written up something of his galva theory which survived and was again took some years before people found, found what a treasure it was that is galva but notice in both cases the mathematics was advanced by these people not because they wanted to solve some practical problem no it was purely theoretical question that they asked and curiosity of a kind which in which they found something beautiful in this and that's how they went about it both abel and galva but their work later had profound applications galva what we call group theory started with galva i mean not quite but anyway he made great contributions to group theory and all that in connection with his work on equations but group theory has tremendous applications these days in physics crystallography for instance and in chemistry these are crystallography after all is a common thing for chemistry and physics and in such disciplines uh, <coughs> group theory plays a role and group theory plays an even more important role in uh, quantum mechanics so these are uh, this kind of thing keeps happening i had already mentioned this now yeah there's another story which illustrates how the pursuit of mathematics is pursuit of is dictated by internal considerations 
all of us know Pythagoras theorem and on, on the left is a tablet is a picture of a tablet discovered in uh, Iraq which I mentioned earlier and it has a list of Pythagorean triplets whole numbers we all know that everybody knows that 3 4 5 is a Pythagorean triplet and 5 12 13 is another Pythagorean triplet these guys had listed and they had many more because this this particular tablet has this There's another tablet which has many more they probably knew at, at least 50 or 60 and maybe even more because what was discovered is only this much so Pythagorean triplets were known even from there and there of course I don't know what they called them but they are now called Pythagorean triplets because we because of Pythagoras theorem <coughs> So, a triplet is a Pythagorean triplet, a, a, a Pythagorean triplet is a triplet of numbers, three numbers, all whole numbers, A, B, C, such that A square plus B square equal to C square. And the Greeks knew a great deal about Pythagorean triplets. In fact, <coughs> this mathematician Diophantus, a Greek who lived in the third century <coughs> uh, of the Christian era of Al in Alexandria, he had, he wrote this book, Diophanti is the name of the, the Diophantis, it's a uh, possessive case of Diophantis, Diophanti Alexandrini of Alexandria and Arithmetic Orum is the name of the book. And he already knew that every Pythagorean triple is essentially the form TPQ, 2PQ, P square minus Q square, P square plus Q square. And its elementary algebra tells you that this is a Pythagorean triple. If p, q are integers, all these three are integers. And then you look at p square minus q square, p square plus q square and 2 p, q. Sometimes you have to divide by 2 because if p and q are both odd, p square minus q square is even. So, you can divide by 2 and that will also give you a Pythagorean triple. Both the, all three can be divided by 2 and you will be done. Anyway, Pythagoras, I mean Diophantus knew this. And in the cut to 17th century, here is this man called here the Fermat. Many of you know about Fermat's last theorem, and maybe many of you know the story, but I will repeat the story because it's one of the most fascinating romantic stories in mathematics. He was a judge, Pierre Fermat was a judge in a provincial court in uh, France. Toulouse was a town in which he was a judge, and apparently he was a pretty competent judge, but he was obsessed with mathematics. Any spare time he had, he worked at mathematics. And he had a copy of Diophantus book, which he followed avidly. And every now and then he would make notes on the margin, his own comments on the work, some, some idea you may have and note it down on the margin of the book. That's the way he studied the book. And one of the notes on the margin was this. It was of course written in Latin, but <coughs> the translation is given here. On the contrary, it is impossible to separate the cube into sum of two cubes. He was, this was written on the page in which Diophantus was <coughs> discussing Pythagorean triples. So, there your square of an integer was being written as sum of two squares. So, he, on the contrary, it is impossible to separate a cube into the sum of two cubes, a fourth power into two fourth powers or generally any power above the second power into powers of the same degree. <coughs> I have a discovered a truly marvelous demonstration of this general theorem which this margin is too narrow to contain. This is what he wrote in that book. Now, and you know, this is uh, the statement, if you like, if very formally, you cannot find whole numbers a, b, c, such that a power n plus b power n equal to c power n, the moment n is greater than to 3. That is the statement which he had made there, that such a statement is true is what he had said and he claimed he had a proof for that. Uh, but he did not publish a proof, he did not write down a proof anywhere. Uh, when they looked up his uh, posthumous papers, they could not find anything. And even this was not known to his contemporaries, it was known to some of them only after his death. And that is because his son published an <coughs> edition of the <coughs> Diophantus book with comments from uh, the marginal comments of uh, Fermat. He did that. And then it became known and he had made this is just one of several comments and in every one of those comments he probably stated the theorem sometimes proving it if the space margin was not uh, too small to hold it and he had stated several theorems and uh, after his death when it became known many, many of those problems fascinated many mathematicians and one by one many of them were solved within 20 years all 
the problems they had uh, claimed to have solved, other people could solve. But this one, no. It had to wait 350 years before it could be solved, this problem. And it fascinated mathematicians no end. Once again, why is this has no earthly use for anything practical? This could, the fact that it does not have a solution, big deal. So what? Is um, the what the practical man may ask. But the mathematician finds it fascinating. He finds it, the question itself a beautiful question. And he finds that formulation, a, a beautiful formulation, that there are no solutions of this kind. In fact, many leading mathematicians spent a lot of time trying to solve this problem. <coughs> but in the process, many of them did not succeed, but in the process, they discovered lots of interesting mathematics. In an attempt to solve, they created new mathematical structures and went on to. Uh, the <coughs> these were some of the mathematicians who tried their hand. Euler managed to prove it for n equal to 3. a power n plus b power n equals c power n. There is no solutions in integers if n is equal to 3 is what Euler proved. Dirichlet proved it for n equal to 5 and this man proved it for uh, n equal to 7. That's, these are the big names in mathematics who attempted the thing. And here is another important uh, mathematician, a woman mathematician. A relative rarity. She proved a very interesting result. It, she did not uh, actually prove the theorem for any particular n, but she made a general contribution which was used by Dirichlet Clay for to solve the case n equal to 5. And then came along this man, Ernest Kumar, who made great progress. He proved this uh, theorem for certain numbers which are called uh, regular primes. It is too complicated to define a regular prime. But you can find lots of regular primes. But it's an open question that there are infinitely many regular primes. But for when n is a regular prime, you could prove it by a certain method. Which, and in the process of developing that method, he developed what we now call modern algebraic number theory. The entire modern algebraic number theory is essentially the handiwork of Ernest Kumar. It's a profound work, and all for what? For an attempt at solving Fermat's last theorem, which has no use outside mathematics. So it's, it gives all that it does is to give pleasure to mathematicians. That's all. And that is the reason they are pursuing it. So, Kumar is one of the big names of the 19th century. Well, finally, the problem was solved in 1994 by this man on the right, Andrew Weiss. He gave the complete solution. And the amount of mathematics that went into the solution is amazing. It used a tremendous lot of work of the 20th century and which in turn depended on work of Kumar and people like him in the 19th century and so on. You know, mathematics kind of builds up to which each, each uh, flow is dependent on the previous flow. You cannot uh, escape that. And what this guy used is a lot of 20 mathematics which developed in the 20th century. Whilst Ten years before Wiles, this man Gerd Faltings proved a very interesting theorem, which is very relevant to Fermat's last theorem. He proved that the x power n plus y power n equals z power n has only finitely many solutions. He could not prove that there is no solutions, but he proved there are finitely many solutions. Of course, when you say finitely many, you have to be a little careful, because if you have one solution, you multiply all the numbers by some fixed integer, you get another solution. If x power n plus y power n equals z power n, then r x power n plus r y power n is obviously equal to r z power n. So, when you say finite, finite up to multiplication by a whole number, yeah. only finite means so that is what Faltings proved. And uh, Faltings, well, once, once again, he, he, he had not quite proved the Fermat's class theorem, but obviously that must be considered great progress towards Fermat's class theorem. It's, his work is not uh, all, all that well known in the mathematical community at large. Fermat's last theorem, of course, is well known because it even appeared in the press. In the media gave it publicity when the theorem was proved, and it, it's easy to state. And his theorem is a little more complicated to state, but it's an important theorem. Well, <coughs> yeah, the I, I mentioned groups. Uh, I think I'll skip that. <coughs> yeah, Descartes who is essentially the inventor of what we call analytic geometry these days. What you, when you write equations of uh, 
straight line, circles and things. They are analytic geometry. He was the man who invented analytic geometry. Before that, geometry and algebra or numbers theory had parallel development. One could not use uh, techniques in geometry. In te the moment Descartes introduced analytic geometry, algebra can be used in the service of geometry. And you can sometimes go back from geometry to algebra. Again, one, the Descartes' invention was not for any practical purposes, though it has come to, uh, to be of a great practical use. The, his, his main reason was to expand the scope of geometry. When you write, write down equations, you know, all the Greeks could consider only circles and straight lines. You want to do something better, look at conics for instance, you have to rely on analytic, what we call analytic geometry or even more complicated figures. Various figures for which names exist only because they can be written, the equations can be written down. And as I said, it also gave an interface between geometry and algebra. A lot of algebra could be simply translated into geometry and vice versa. But we know it has tremendous applications even in the world of finance. Here is this guy contemplating his profit graph. Graphs have come to stay, they are more very important for in every activity practically. And certainly Descartes wouldn't even know that such a guy would come to exist in his days. So he certainly did not think of the applications to finance and other disciplines. <coughs> you know, the fact that something which started purely mathematically becomes effective in applications has been described by this man Paul Wigner, who is a Nobel, for, Nobel laureate in physics. He gave a lecture which, uh, which was entitled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. What he was pointing out was that uh, something which started out as purely mathematics becomes important and very relevant to something else. So that is what he was trying to say. Oh, I'm sorry, I think I've run out of time. Anyway, I'll just say he claimed this, this he said is, is unrealistic. So that's why he called it unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. And but a very opposite view has been expressed by Darwin. He said, let me, yeah, every new body of discovery is mathematical in form because there is no other guidance we can have. This is what a person like Darwin says. And we all think biologists have no great sympathy for mathematics. Well, <coughs> I don't think I want to say much more. Let me uh, close with two comments. One is that, you see, one recognizes uh, every creative activity, there is always a certain amount of conflict between imagination and discipline. In, uh, in natural sciences, the discipline comes from the external source. You can build a beautiful theory, but it has to agree with what nature is doing, which is only by experimenting you will find out whether it agrees with what nature does, or there are experiments which nature itself provides, only if it agrees. In mathematics, there is no external force applying discipline. It's internal. You have to argue out everything logically, correctly. That's one aspect. But there's another dis disciplining factor which people don't recognize. That is aesthetics. Mathematician, why does he pursue one problem but not another? What he, per what he pursues is beautiful is what he perceives. So aesthetics acts as a disciplining factor. Apart from the rigors of logic, Discipline is also imposed by this. So, you know, in a sense, uh, <coughs> the, other, the other discipline imposed by logic is also important, but aesthetics is also an important factor. Finally, I, my title was a question mark. Is, is mathematics art that would rather be science? Now, the case I have been making is that mathematics is like art. Many of the characteristics I described are essentially like art. The fact that it derives its inspiration from internally, the fact that uh, it's a pursuit of beauty. Everybody agrees that art is pursuit of beauty, and I'm saying that mathematics is also pursuit of beauty. Many of these aspects is very similar to art. But why do I say why why, why is mathematics? Why did I put a question mark? Because mathematicians are more comfortable in the company of scientists, not in the company of artists. For one thing, the scientist has some appreciation of the value of mathematics for their own discipline. The artist doesn't have any use for mathematics, so they cannot see why it should be done at all. But the scientist sees that it has something 
to do with his own work and he can appreciate that and the, you know the logical thinking is another aspect which the scientist also has to employ so for that reason the scientist has an appreciation and naturally the mathematician is more uh, more comfortable in the company of people who has some appreciation of, for his work and not for people like uh, Keats who dismisses all sciences useless I mean as ugly if you like so uh, that's the reason for the title thank you for your attention